Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for part two of the Haunted Hinsdale House video. If you have not seen part one yet, it is linked in the description box and you should watch that first because one does always come before two. So we are going to pick up right where we left off, but we are also quickly going to talk about the priest who would end up performing the famous exorcism at Hinsdale House. Alphonsus Trebold was born in Rochester, New York in 1925, and he was fascinated from a very young age by several things. The paranormal, magic, witchcraft, the occult, and religion. He joined the Franciscan Order and was ordained in 1951 and began teaching theology at St. Bonaventure University, where he was a very popular teacher, especially with the students in his most popular class, Religion and the Paranormal. He would always leave the front row open for any visiting ghosts who wanted to sit in on his lectures. He was also remembered by others as smart with a keen sense of humor, a man who used to smoke cigars and use a fake human skull as an ashtray, but also a man who was very intent on combining his passion for the supernatural with his passion for God, saying once in an interview, quote, any power that we have has to ultimately come from God. Very often, you will find that people associate any kind of paranormal ability, for instance, ESP, with something evil. They say it's the devil. No, it it isn't. It's just things we don't understand. End quote. Father Alphonsus became internationally known in this field and consulted on many paranormal cases, including the Amityville Horror. So it was no surprise, especially considering the proximity of Hinsdale to Rochester, that Father Alphonsus would find himself involved with the Dandies and their very haunted house. Before we dive right in, though, I'd like to have a word from the sponsor of this video, Native. So I've been using Native deodorants and body washes for a few months now. The deodorant I've been using longer, the body wash is a more recent addition, but I absolutely love them. The only thing that could make native deodorant better was if I didn't have to feel guilty about the plastic packaging they come in. And now I don't have to. Native has just released a plastic-free version of their deodorant. Customers of Native asked for non-plastic packaging, and Native is a company who cares, so they delivered. The packaging is made of 100% paperboard, sourced from responsibly managed forests. They contain 0% plastic, and Native is also a proud partner of 1% for the planet, committing 1% of plastic-free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Even though the packaging is different, it is the same great product inside. Native deodorants remain aluminum-free, paraben-free, and sulfate-free, with familiar and clean ingredients such as coconut oil and shea butter. They are vegan and cruelty-free and are available in a wide variety of scents that will leave you smelling clean and fresh all day, even after a strenuous workout or sitting down in front of four hot lights and recording two long videos in one day. The scents so far that I have tried are cucumber and mint, which smells so fresh and so clean. Citrus and herbal musk, which is a nice light floral for when you're feeling a little sassy, a little flirty, and coconut vanilla, which actually transports me to a white sand beach with a drink in my hand every time I use it. It smells like vacation. It smells like 2020 never happened, which would be the ultimate vacation if 2020 had never happened. And a little goes a long way. Two swipes is literally all you need and there's no chalky crumbled bits left behind after. Native deodorants are great for when you're on the go because you don't have to worry about them leaving behind a sticky texture or taking forever to dry. Your underarms will thank you and feel clean and dry every time you use these deodorants. Three plastic-free deodorants are normally $39, but if you use my link in the description box and code STEPHANIE4, you'll get them for $29. That's 25% off. Once again, the code is STEPHANIE4, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-4. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring this video, and thanks to all of you who understand sponsors are essential in allowing me to continue bringing you content and supporting these sponsors supports the channel. Let's get back to the video now. So it seemed that Beth's room was the one getting the most activity. 
One night, she saw a woman with long, dark hair staring at her from outside her bedroom window. And when she locked eyes with this apparition, Beth suddenly found herself disoriented, not knowing if she was outside or inside. She also constantly complained of feeling a presence in her room and feeling someone sitting on her bed in the darkness. Clara's mother, who would sleep in Beth's room when she visited overnight, mentioned feeling the same things. Beth would also hear voices outside her window, but she could never quite make out what they were saying. On August 30th, Clara wrote in her journal, quote, Beth's room is jumping today. We have developed many codes when we mean a room is disturbed. Jumping is one of them. I don't know how to describe a hostile atmosphere to someone who has never experienced one, but I'll try. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, you're restless. Sometimes you feel as though something is watching you and waiting. Or you get the vague feeling there's something you've forgotten to do, an uneasy feeling of fear, depression, or apprehension. Have you ever been present at a friend's house when there's obvious tension in the air and you feel you've interrupted a quarrel? That uneasy, squirming feeling is much the same. End quote. Mary's room, which was located upstairs off the master bedroom, had been sitting vacant and was considered to be the worst room in the house. Remember from the first part of the series of videos that three of the family's animals had died in Mary's room of mysterious causes and the vet had advised the family to not allow animals to go in there any longer. There were constant footsteps and knocking sounds heard from the room, and any time anyone would walk in, they would be hit by a freezing cold that seemed to start right at the doorway, but could not be felt from outside the room. By August 6th, Mary had refused to sleep in the room, and Clara wrote in her journal, quote, it's lucky that Phil works so Mary can sleep with me. The atmosphere in her room is unbelievable. There seems to be a vacuum in there. There's a very strong, very discernible physical pressure on your ears and temples. It causes your ears to pop as though the atmosphere were rarefied. The only comparison I can make is the feeling when your ears pop on an airplane. In addition, if anyone is outside the window just a few feet away, it's as though they are worlds away and you can hardly hear them. Tonight, Mary and I lay in bed listening to what sounded like furniture being moved around downstairs. When I went down to check, Beth said she was lying in bed listening to furniture being moved around in Mary's room. In addition, Mary's bed was creaking under someone's weight, even though the room was closed and empty. At least, I thought it was. End quote. There had also been a very disturbing change in Laura. Remember that the girls had been swimming and had seen a woman dancing by the pond. Laura had not seen the woman she claimed to have been facing in the other direction. But when the other two were telling Clara about the experience, Laura commented very darkly, I bet that lady hanged herself. Her eyes were bulging out of her head. During the first week of August, Clara was told by some friends that Laura had been accusing every male around her of molesting her. At first, Clara was obviously just worried about her daughter, but upon further thought, she considered this behavior might be a symptom of Laura's learning disability, which was known to cause emotional issues. Clara and Phil talked to Laura about her claims, and then Clara later wrote in her journal about questioning Laura and said, quote, the disconcerting thing about the whole thing was that when we questioned her, we had the distinct feeling that it wasn't Laura who answered us. Her phrasing was different, strangely formal and old-fashioned, and there was an odd look in her eyes. In fact, she seemed impersonally amused by the whole thing, end quote. Now, Clara had met a psychic named Wally through a friend of hers, and he decided to drive up from Buffalo to see the house himself. He experienced a good deal of car trouble on the drive up, culminating in the exhaust system falling out of the car as he turned onto the road that Hinsdale House was located on. Later, it would be discovered the car also had a gas leak. As soon as Wally arrived, he announced that he felt something didn't want him there. He seemed to believe the place was haunted by a family, a father, a mother, a son, and a grandmother. And this family did not approve of how loud and chaotic the house had become since the dandies moved in. Without even knowing what had been going on with Laura upon meeting her, Wally informed her parents that the house was affecting her negatively. A family friend had also informed Clara that she'd been swimming in the pond with Laura and she was worried about the little girl, so this, this woman had warned Laura not to swim out too far, to which Laura responded, quote, It's okay. I know I'm going to die young, and it doesn't matter because I've seen everything anyway. 
end quote. According to Clara's friend, when Laura said these words, her eyes had narrowed to resemble cat eyes. Now, this psychic from Buffalo, Wally, had told the dandies to get Laura out of the damn house, so they did, sending her to live with Clara's parents in Buffalo, and Mary went with her. Mary was the youngest, Laura was the second youngest. This had been on August 8th, and 10 days later, on August 18th, Laura and Mary came home, even though Clara didn't know if it was such a good idea, but summer was drawing to a close. They couldn't be gone forever. School would be starting soon. But within no time of being back, Laura began reporting incidences of harassment from unseen sources. There would be the smell of a dead animal in her room. She would feel someone touching her in the middle of the night. Her purse hanging from a hook over her bed would just start swinging, even though there was no breeze or draft. On Tuesday, August 28, 1973, Laura got up to use the bathroom at around 3 a.m. She had been sleeping in her mother's room, so Clara heard her when she gasped, and they both stared at the eerie red light coming from downstairs. So remember that Clara's bedroom, the master bedroom, is on the second floor, along with two other bedrooms that are mostly unoccupied at this point. So if Laura is sleeping with Clara in her bed, she's going to have to go downstairs in order to use the bathroom. So when she got up out of bed and she walked towards the stairs, she saw this red light coming from downstairs. Clara ran down to discover that someone had turned all the burners of the stove on and they must have been that way for a while since they were almost white hot and they were giving off this glow but nobody had turned the burners on. It had been mid-July when Clara had been searching around for someone who could help them with whatever was happening at their house when she stumbled upon Father Alphonsus. Now, he paid them a visit and listened to each member of the family explain their specific experiences to him, all while he puffed on his pipe. At the end of all of this, he simply nodded and asked if he could return at nightfall, So maybe he could see some of this activity for himself. He came back that evening and nothing happened as he strolled around the grounds. But he let the family know that he believed them and they should call if they ever needed him for anything. Now at the end of that month, after the girls swimming in the pond had seen a dancing woman and Laura had begun to act oddly, Clara made that call and Father Al promised to get out there as soon as he could. He arrived later that same day, which was July 29th, with another priest. The two men began spreading blessings throughout the house, hoping it would do the trick, even though it had already been blessed before. Father Al began making more trips to Hinsdale House, talking with the family, walking around with his arms tucked neatly behind his back, inspecting things, and helping the dandies chase off the looky-loos who had been showing up in droves since an Olean newspaper had done a story about the house. On Wednesday, August 29th, Clara wrote in her journal, quote, Father Al came to visit today and said Mass on our kitchen table. Afterwards, he said a simple exorcism and carried the host around the house and grounds. End quote. Father Al told them he believed at this point he had taken the spirits with him, but the activity continued. Now, someone from the campgrounds in the hills located above the house reported seeing a woman dressed in sheer gauzy clothes swaying as if she was dancing, and this was outside the window of her trailer at the campground. Clara's sister-in-law spotted the face of a woman as she was walking through the kitchen. The face had been fuzzy and not very clear, but she had seen it on the stairs that led up to the master bedroom and Mary's bedroom as well. Beth continued to report, night after night, noises coming from the crawl space that prevented her from sleeping. No one was brave enough to open the door to the narrow room and check. And remember, the crawl space would have been located um, on the second floor above the stairs that would lead downstairs. On September 3rd, Clara had friends over for dinner, when the static feeling of doom settled once again upon the house. They were all sitting in the living room when they began to hear loud footsteps coming from upstairs, coming from Mary's room. One of her guests asked Clara who was being so loud up there, and Clara informed her there was no one upstairs. So another guest ventured up himself to see if she was lying, and he threw open the door to Mary's room only to find there was nothing in there, just a blast of icy cold air. Now, Phil had been telling his wife and children for months that they were just imagining things, but he could not deny that his family was clearly terrified, and this worried him. In early September, Phil began to feel something almost calling to him, a presence beckoning him from the tree line that surrounded the property, and he decided he would walk over and check it out. 
This gave Clara a bad feeling, so she followed him, trying to convince him to just go to work and ignore it. As they circled the pond, they could feel several cold pockets in the air, especially near the furthest end of the pond where the girls had seen that woman dancing. Eventually, Phil and Clara began to head back to the house, but as Clara looked up, she was startled to see a figure in the window of Beth's room. This figure was kneeling besides Beth's dresser. Her strawberry blonde hair was covered by a pale pink cap. And Clara knew that this girl was not any of her own children's friends. And she was trying to point this girl out to Phil when Beth and her boyfriend, Jeff, walked out of the house and told Clara and Phil that they'd been sitting on the front porch when a white clad figure had darted past them. So all of this is kind of happening at once, right? Phil feels this weird presence beckoning him from the tree line. He goes over to investigate. Clara goes with him as they're walking around the pond. They encounter many cold spots of air, especially where... The girls had seen the woman dancing on the banks of the pond. As they're walking back towards the house, Clara sees this, this strange young girl kneeling in front of Beth's dresser through Beth's window. And Beth's room was on the first floor so she could see this girl. And as she's about to point this out to her husband, Beth and her boyfriend, Jeff, walk up to Clara and Phil and say, you know, we're sitting on the front porch and this person dressed in white ran past us and they wanted to know if it was Phil or Clara who had been, you know, running past them dressed in white. When Phil and Clara had been initially making their way towards the pond, it was still light outside. But since then, the sun had begun to sink and dusk was coming. Phil told Clara that the only explanation was somebody must be messing with them. Maybe this was just a run-of-the-mill intruder. So Beth's boyfriend, Jeff, who drove a motorcycle, had pulled his bike up and it was using its headlight to scan the yard and the pond to search for intruders when suddenly they heard a scream coming from the rear of the house. It was Mary who'd been standing outside with Beth when she saw a woman in her room looking out at her from the window. So remember now, Beth's room is on the ground floor and Clara, her mother, saw a girl in Beth's room on the ground floor. And then later, Beth and Mary are standing outside and they look up where Mary's room is on the second floor and Mary sees somebody staring at her through her own window. Now Beth supported this saying that when Mary screamed, she'd also looked up at the window quickly and saw the curtain dropping. All of them, including Logical Phil, ran into the house, terrified, only to find the house in a very different state than they had left it. All of the lights upstairs were turned on, though they'd been previously off, and the door to the root cellar located in the bathroom on the first floor was flung open, even though the family always made sure it was not only closed, but bolted. They never went down there. It was as if an explosion of supernatural activity had started. Clara wrote in her book, quote, Beth and Jeff saw a man standing on the front yard. Clara wrote in her book, quote, Beth and Jeff saw a man standing on the front lawn at the corner of the house. Phil ran out there only to have someone scream that there was something or someone in the yard. It got so bad that I couldn't look out the windows because every time I did, I got the impression of something passing by, end quote. So essentially, it was like everything was happening at once, right? All this activity was happening at once to the point where you would run after one sort of situation and there would be somebody yelling at you that there was another one happening over there and you'd run towards that and then it would keep happening. Now, the eldest dandy child and only son, Mike, and his friend, Randy, jumped into the car to drive down the street to see if there was any people trespassing. But at one point, Mike looked into the back seat and saw a depression there as if they had an invisible passenger. They turned around and drove back to the house. Inside the house, another shriek came from Beth, who had been walking into the living room when she'd spotted a strawberry blonde girl sitting on her bed. The same girl her mother had seen earlier, but hadn't had time to tell anyone about yet with all the chaos happening. While Clara was talking to Beth and they were comparing stories about the strawberry blonde girl, Phil came running downstairs, breathlessly telling them that all the lights upstairs had been turned off now. On his way back down, he decided in a moment of delirium and absolute insanity, I think, to open the crawl space door, which was located over the stairs heading down and look inside. Clara wrote in her book, quote, Our chimney, which had been neatly mortared, was taken apart brick by brick, and carefully stacked against the other wall. 
So Beth had heard something. When Beth saw the chimney, or what was left of it, she began to cry, end quote. And what Claire's referring to in, in this little passage here is Beth had been saying for weeks that she was hearing something coming out of the crawl space. She kept hearing sounds like something was being dragged, something was being moved, and she was obviously too afraid to look into the crawl space to see what it was. And seeing that the chimney had been sort of taken apart and then stacked against the wall, Beth realized that she'd been hearing something real. And I don't know what's worse, imagining that you're hearing something in the crawl space or actually figuring out that you did hear something in the crawl space and not knowing what it was that had made those noises. So Clara placed a call to Father Al, who said he was getting in the car to come right over. When he arrived, the family was huddled together in the living room, averting their eyes from the windows, pale and shivering. Once he was there, he asked them to tell him everything, and as he was talking to Clara in the kitchen, Phil took Father Al's big flashlight into the yard and he began scanning the property. His surprised voice reached Clara and Father Al in the kitchen. He was calling them and asking them to come outside. Phil was pointing the flashlight in the direction of the pond, and they could see a young girl wearing a sheer nightgown walking along the path. According to Clara, as the girl walked, her long nightgown swayed and changed from white to purple and back to white. It had been a very active day. Everybody was exhausted, but nobody felt safe going to sleep after all they'd seen and experienced that day, really as a family, right? Because they pretty much were all there and they were experiencing these things and seeing them all together. So nobody really wanted to go to bed. <laughs> so Father Al and Phil stayed up all night keeping watch while the others got some rest. The next morning, things started up again. Clara was missing her purse and she finally found it behind the bathroom door on the bathroom scale minus $4. Father Al told her that money going missing like that could be a way of splitting the family up, of getting them to turn on each other and accuse each other of theft, accuse each other of being the culprit. And it continued like this for a while. Friends of Mike's would come at night to patrol the grounds in case the intruders were actual people intruding. And every single night they saw and heard strange things. One night they'd seen a figure in a small boat drifting on the pond. But as they tried to focus, their flashlights went out and wouldn't turn back on. Mike called Clara into his room one day, telling her that he thought it looked foggy in there. And she wrote this in her book, saying, quote, When I went in, it wasn't foggy, but that was as good a way as any to describe the sensation. Everything in the room was out of focus. We tried changing the lighting, but it didn't help. End quote. There were new and strange smells coming from Beth's room now, a strange perfume that no one in the house used, the smell of cigar smoke. On September 8th, Beth had gotten into bed to go to sleep and had just turned the lights off when she heard the drawer of her bedside table open, and she looked over to see who she thought was her mother standing in front of the open drawer and looking at her diary. Clara writes, quote, Since she thought it was me, she asked what was wrong. The woman said, are you sure it was June 29th? Beth assumed she meant a fire that had taken place on that day down the road, and coincidentally, it was also the day our problems began in earnest. We had discussed the coincidence, so Beth just said, that's what my diary says. Without another word, the woman put down the diary and left the room. Her back had been to Beth the whole time, but when morning came, Beth realized there had been so much wrong with the interaction. She knew her mother didn't have a long nightgown like that, and how would she have been able to read the diary in the dark? A few days later, on September 13th, they were driving into town to do some shopping when the car suddenly filled up with the scent of this perfume. That same strange perfume that could sometimes be smelled in Beth's room. It got so bad that they had to open the windows and Clara drove along trying to figure out what that scent was. It was somewhat familiar to her. It was soft and floral like gardenias or verbena. When she got home, she looked up what the notes of verbena were, only to find that it was something that had been used to make perfumes a very long time ago. On September 19th, Father Al brought a psychic to visit the dandies, a man named Alex, who had been lecturing at St. Bonaventure that day. This man claimed that his powers were so strong, he could shake your hand and know if you were going to die soon. Alex and Father Al walked around the house, and then Alex met with the family in the living room to tell them what his impressions of the house had been. According to Clara's book, Alex looked into her eyes and said, quote, Did you know you had a mass murder here? End quote. 
Alex told them he'd seen seven spirits, some very clear and others not so much. One man had been stabbed, a woman had been hanged, another woman had been drowned, another man had been beaten to death, and a young girl about the age of 18 had been beaten and tortured to death. This girl had strawberry blonde hair. Alex told the Dandy family that this had happened 100 years before, and he believed there were graves nearby that had been disturbed. Now, Clara remembered that when they'd first moved in, they'd torn down an old barn to make room for the pond. And she also remembered that during the first weeks of being there, the dogs had brought home large bones, which she had thrown out. But now she wished she hadn't. A lot of the figures were being seen by the pond, and maybe they were displeased that she'd tossed away their remains. Alex told the dandies that before these people were buried, their bodies had been kept in the crawl space, and when he had opened the door to the crawl space, he had seen bodies piled like stacks of firewood. He said there was one more spirit who had not been connected to these gruesome murders. She was an old woman, about 90, and she had died recently. Afterwards, Clara was able to confirm that one of the previous owners of the home had died there during the summer shortly before they'd arrived. Oh, and let me tell you about the picture. It was a Polaroid taken by some of Mike's friends who would do their nightly patrols around the grounds. The kids had brought the camera with them because at this point, everyone in the area knew the house was haunted. So they were taking pictures of and around the house. And then they would pull them out and look at them to see if they like had captured anything supernatural. Well, as they were doing this, they saw a man by the pond and they thought he was a trespasser. So they ran over to confront him, but the man started running away towards the tree line. Once there, the man threw himself against a tree and raised his hands up. So the kid with the camera snapped a picture and the other kid went towards the man who just completely disappeared. Clara describes the man in the picture in her book, saying, quote, the man was middle-aged, dressed in a navy blue jacket, and seemed to be hurt. His nose was pushed to one side, and his jaw was twisted. There also seemed to be either a cut or blood down the side of his face. His mouth was open in a silent scream, and he was plainly terrified. Funny, though, he wasn't looking towards the boys, but behind them and to their left. Did he see something they couldn't? He was frightened of something that didn't seem to be the boys. Another interesting thing... The figure had a narrow blue glow around it. It couldn't have been a reflection since the only thing behind him was a very non-reflective tree, end quote. A few days later, Father L came to retrieve the picture. He told Clara that a blue aura usually signifies that a person or spirit is good, but for further review, he decided to send it to the American Institute for Psychic Research in New York City. Since the psychic, Alex, had been there, things had calmed down, and he'd asked Clara and her family to do some research into the history of Hinsdale House and also to locate some possible burial sites in the area. Mike and his friends took on the task of seeking out grave sites, and one night on October 1st, 1973, Mike came home late, out of breath, and in quite a state. He told his mother that he and his friends had gone up Burton Road when they saw a light in the trees and they realized every time they got closer to the light, it would suddenly go out. They continued walking through these cold spots and hearing noises coming from the woods. At one point, they felt like they were being followed, so they all went home. Now, this is a teenage boy, you know, not a little kid. And he told his mother that he felt he had brought someone home with him and he was afraid to go back downstairs to his bedroom. As they were talking, the back door downstairs suddenly opened and then slammed shut. Despite the scare they had gotten that first night, Mike and his friends had to know where that road led and if it led out at an old stagecoach route they'd found on an old map. It was 16 days later by the time they felt brave enough to attempt it again, and it would be the first of several attempts that each ended with something going terribly wrong. The first time, one of Mike's buddies went into a trance. The second time, three of his friends collapsed. The next time, just two of them went together in a car, feeling safer that way than walking out in the open. And these two boys were driving when they claimed to see a headless man in the middle of the road, and they were forced to swerve. When they had parked, the other boy in the car lost control of his right hand, and without him knowing what was happening, he drew a picture of a saw with a stick figure next to it on the windshield of the car. And then on October 21st, a state trooper paid a visit to Hinsdale House to inform Clara and Phil that their son Mike had been in a bad accident and he was unconscious at the Olean Hospital. Mike had to undergo emergency surgery to have his spleen removed because he was bleeding internally. 
Before he had passed out, Mike kept asking the police if they'd saved the other guy in the car with him, but there was no passenger that anyone could find. On the night of October 23rd, Phil decided to sleep on the couch to be closer to the phone in case the hospital called with updates on Mike's condition. Here's what Clara writes about this in her book. Quote, He was in that state, bordering on sleep, when he saw five men come out of the door, which now opened into a closet. Before remodeling, it was a second door to the front porch. Phil said the men were dressed in Little Lord Fauntleroy costumes. By the descriptions, I would have called them Puritan outfits. However, the men were discussing someone and saying, should we wait or take him now? After apparently making a decision, they went out the same way they came in. Phil was in a cold sweat. This type of experience was new to him. By this time, he took it to mean that these men were deciding whether Mike should be allowed to live or not. So Phil's sleeping on the couch. He sees these men walk through a door that used to be a door that led to the outside but was now just a closet. And they start talking. Is it time for us to, to take him now or do we wait? And Phil thought that they were talking about his son, Mike, who was in the hospital fighting for his life. And just to elaborate on this a little bit, Mike ended up being okay the next day when they went to visit him very early in the morning. But his roommate, also another young man who had recently been in an accident, passed over the course of the night. So that is something to uh, keep in mind and to really creep you out a little bit more if you already weren't there. So Mike had to stay in the hospital for several weeks before he was allowed to come home, but there was some other drama going on with Beth and her boyfriend, Jeff. Beth had broken up with Jeff because apparently he was getting too possessive, but Jeff was still close to the Dandy family, so about a week and a half after Beth had broken up with him, he paid the family a visit to show them a new car he had bought. This was November 24th, and after leaving Hinsdale House that evening, Jeff also got into a really bad car crash in almost the exact same place that Mike had. He was in really bad shape and Beth went to Buffalo for a week to help take care of him in the hospital, but when she got back, she claimed that the frequency and volume of the people talking outside her window had increased. In her book, Clara says, quote, it was a man and a woman talking. Occasionally, the talks would be punctuated by someone hitting our oil storage tank also outside her window hard. This even I heard. What really alarmed Beth the most was that they started calling her by name, end quote. And it wasn't just strange voices and mysterious car accidents. It wasn't even just apparitions and items being moved or missing. It seemed that the spirits could even occupy those in or around Hinsdale House. On December 8th, Mike and a group of his friends who were staying the night witnessed Beth sleepwalking, or so they thought. She walked over the boys in sleeping bags on the floor and sat on the couch holding an invisible ball and saying, it's all mine. Mama gave it to me. It's all mine. So pretty. And then she walked into the bathroom and proceeded to apparently knead invisible dough over the bathtub. Later, the family would find out that the bathroom off the kitchen had once been a pantry, and where the bathtub was used to be a big work counter. Beth also tried to leave the house at this point, but the boys stopped her, and they led her over to a metal cot that one of the boys had been sleeping on, and when she sat down on it, if both sides bent and the cot broke, even though she only weighed 110 pounds. Worst of all, during this whole thing, Beth's normally brown eyes had been a vivid blue. Another friend of Mike's had a similar experience a few days later when he was pulling up to Hinsdale House with a couple other kids. As they drove past the entrance to the road, he looked at the old barn that was on the premises and he started shouting, where are the horses? And as the car pulled into the driveway, this guy who was shouting, where are the horses? He ran out of the car saying he had to help Pa with the chores. Clara wrote in her book, quote, he was very confused and couldn't remember anything after getting in the car. I guess Beth wasn't the only one who's been affected. Strange, it seemed they were both headed towards the pond or the barn, end quote. Then the dandies got word from school that Beth had tried to not only jump out of the window of a girl's bathroom, but she had also made an attempt to strangle herself in the chorus room. Five days later, Clara, Beth, and another local boy named Tim were sitting on the couch in the living room, when all of a sudden, Clara noticed Beth's eyes were blue and she was staring at Tim. Clara said Beth had the strangest smile on her face. Her lips were in a straight line across her face and they bent up only at the corners. Beth began to act much differently in the following days. 
One night, when the kids were having friends sleep over for a New Year's Eve party, she had pulled a muscle in her back and Clara had given her a muscle relaxer. But she began to act almost hyper after this, which is not something that muscle relaxers do to you. And she also told some of the other kids that she'd taken 10 muscle relaxers, which wasn't true because Clara counted what she had in the bottle. So Beth began talking and laughing very loudly, very out of character for herself. She couldn't sit still. She was almost manic. And they decided to take her to the hospital. And on the drive there, she continued to twitch and move almost as if she had no control of herself. Clara wrote in her book, quote, Phil started to carry Beth into the emergency room and she went completely limp. They both almost fell to the ground. Tim, who had come with them to the hospital, grabbed her and she immediately went stiff as a board. She continued with the same behavior once she was finally in the exam room. One minute she was lucid, the next she was almost incoherent, speaking a different language. Her stomach was pumped and they found nothing, no drugs, and yet her brown eyes were blue, end quote. The next day, when Beth was allowed to come home, the doctor mentioned the changing eye color, and Clara explained what was happening, to which he responded, Why don't you get out of that house? That was the thing, though. The dandies had poured all of their money into that house, and with so much publicity on the strange happenings going on there, no one local would buy it, and even someone from out of town would soon be filled in on why the dandies were trying to sell so badly. Everything just got worse from there on out. One night, Beth was in her room listening to music when the voices started up and she fell into a trance. Clara walked into the room and could hear as clear as day a woman and a man conversing. The man said, what do we do now? She's taking her to the doctor. The woman responded, I don't know. It's easier when she's sick. Now, Beth had been suffering from bad stomach problems that had been plaguing her for over a month and Clara had taken her to a doctor to have it checked out. Was that what these voices were discussing? Had they been making Beth sick or at least making her feel like she was sick? Clara and Phil had also bought Mike a new car because he was going to be leaving for college the following fall. And one day Phil borrowed it to take it to work, wanting to make sure it was safe to drive before Mike got in it and started driving it, considering what had happened the last time he'd been behind the wheel. On the way home that evening, Phil got into a car accident. He had swerved to avoid a tractor trailer And the little car skidded off the road, flipped a few times, and landed upside down in a field. A few weeks later, a friend of Mike's named Keith borrowed Phil's car to take to a school dance. And he too was in an accident, hit head-on by another car who did not have their headlights on when he was going over a bridge. The car was able to be fixed, but just three days later, Mike borrowed it since his new one had been totaled by Phil. And while he was driving, he claimed the steering wheel would not respond, and he had driven into a tree. It was pretty clear to the dandies that something had to give. At this point, they were sitting ducks in this house and there was a force that clearly did not want them there. Father Ale and the psychic Alex returned with students from New York University who were making a film about the haunting. They attempted to do another exorcism. Clara explains what happened during this exorcism in her book. She says, quote, In the evening, the family knelt at the center of the living room floor with Father Ale and Alex and we all held hands. First, Alex drew all negative powers present into him and dispelled them. And then Father Al read the church's simple exorcism rite. When they were finished, we expected to be able to rise. My knees were beginning to give out. Glancing around, I could see no one else in the circle was in much better shape. We were all wobbling, and still the cameraman did not tell us to break. It seems that during Alex's ceremony and the whole time Father Al was performing the age-old exorcism rite, there were horrible screams and groans outside which seemed to be coming from the house itself. They continued to roll the cameras and the sound equipment for as long as the incredible sounds lasted. End quote. Now this happened on April 14, 1974. For months, nothing else happened, and the house sat quiet. Mike left to join the Navy. Laura moved into his room because it was bigger than her own upstairs. Beth got engaged to Tim and was planning to marry him that summer. Everything was good for the first time in a long time. But then on Sunday, July 7th, the entire family was at Beth's wedding shower except for Phil who had to leave early to go home and change so he could make it to his second job on time. He ran upstairs to the bedroom and he stopped dead. What he saw terrified him. He saw a book floating in midair. A few days later, Laura was harassed by a black ball of fur under her bed with pointed teeth. The next day, she moved back into her smaller room upstairs, and Clara hung brightly colored daisy-patterned wallpaper in Mike's room in the hopes that the cheery colors would chase away the darkness. 
On July 19th, Clara was in bed when she found herself paralyzed. Now remember, Mary's room was right off the master bedroom, and through the open door, Mary would have been able to see her mother, so she called out to Clara, and Clara, not wanting to scare Mary, answered normally. And they both said goodnight to each other, even though Clara was paralyzed and she couldn't move. And Claire claims that these periods of paralysis kept happening that same night, lasting a few minutes each time. And finally, Claire got so scared when she was unfrozen for a moment, she was able to call out to Phil, which woke Mary up. When Phil came upstairs, Mary walked out and told Clara that the reason she'd called out to her was because she'd seen a boy dressed in jeans standing in Claire's room next to the TV watching her. When Clara had responded back normally, Mary assumed maybe it was just one of the neighborhood boys or one of Mike's friends or something, or maybe it was just her imagination. But the figure had stood there the entire time until Clara had called out to Phil, and then it disappeared. Now, after Beth got married and moved out that August, Clara and Phil had to take a really close look at their finances. They'd spent a lot of money on the wedding, and they had been trying to sell the house, but no one would buy it because the dandies were pretty infamous now for having a haunted house. They were also honest about what was happening there. They didn't want to sell the house to another unsuspecting family. They were very close to going bankrupt, and the next month, on September 29th, they finally did. And things were not getting better with the house. These things were still happening. They were scary. They were constant. It was torture. They sent the kids that remained to stay with Clara's parents in Buffalo, along with most of the pets as well. On Sunday, October 13th, it was just Phil and Clara in the house alone. And I'll let her tell you about it in her own words. Today, we went to bed early. We had just settled down when a car drove into the yard. Phil jumped up and ran to the back door. There was no car, yet we had seen the lights and heard the motor. There had even been the sound of a car door slamming. He no sooner got into bed when it happened again. This happened six more times before I could get him to ignore the lights and sounds. Then, just as we started to relax, a gong started in the cellar. A real Chinese gong. And it was loud. Again, Phil raced downstairs. Again, nothing. In rapid succession, we were subjected to sounds of a baby crying, a whistle, a siren, bells, and a repeat of the gong. Each time, Phil insisted on investigating. Finally, whether because of my persuasive powers or more likely out of sheer exhaustion, he ignored the noises. Thereafter, all we heard were the familiar footsteps. On Thursday, October 17th, 1974, Phil and Claire Dandy drove away from the house with no plans to ever return. And the question is now, what happened to the Dandy family? Did they leave their bad luck behind them with the house or did it follow them? Well, you be the judge. Phil, Clara, Laura, and Mary moved to California, where Phil had gotten a job in San Jose. Within five years, Clara divorced Phil, feeling she was no longer able to sustain the relationship and that things had been strained with them even before arriving at Hinsdale House. In 1990, Clara moved to Oregon, finding California too expensive to live in. Beth had ended up marrying this, this young man, Tim, and they had a good marriage, which produced two children. Mary also got married in 1989. But little Laura, who had predicted her own early death, died on September 1st, 1991, at the age of 31. Since leaving New York, Laura had never been the same and struggled with bad physical and mental health issues. She would always tell people how she longed to return to Hinsdale House, that it was calling to her, and eventually she overdosed on her prescription medication. After leaving the house and doing some more research, Clara learned that a family who had lived there 23 years before the Dandies moved in had also consulted a priest to come and help them with their troubled home. After the Dandies moved, several others tried to make a go of it there. The first family, who had publicly mocked them for thinking it was haunted, they only lasted a year there. And then they moved out and they moved to Florida. The second family experienced many of the same things. And the marriage between the husband and wife quickly went bad, went downhill, causing her to leave with the children and him to live there alone. Now, Clara Miller is the author of the book Echoes of a Haunting, which is about the haunted Hinsdale house. And Clara Miller is just the maiden name of Clara Dandy. She swears up and down. She's not lying about any of it. And in fact, there are medical and police records to back up at least the car accidents. There's also several witnesses who were present for much of the hauntings, mostly friends of the Dandy children, but also members of their own family, uh, extended members of the family, Clara's parents, Clara's brother, his wife. There's also neighbors, the campers that would stay in the campgrounds above the house. Is the Hinsdale house haunted? Well, like I said, I went there myself last spring with my daughter Nev to answer that question. Granted, 
I went there before I read this book. Probably if I had read this book before I went to the house, I wouldn't have gone to the house. I already told you a little bit of my experiences. A bit of car trouble, a speeding ticket, constant flies and bees all over the place. But that was just outside. Once inside, Dan, who owns the house now, brought out some equipment for us to use. And that's when things got a little spooky. And I'm going to uh, play you a video of that now. Was that Mike? Did you say Mike? Well, whoever you are, it's very nice to meet you. I wish you could talk to me. Do you have anything to say? My name is Stephanie. What is your name? Other areas in the house where I found myself very creeped out was the bathroom on the first floor, the, uh, the root cellar, and the living room where the exorcism took place. Father Al lectured at St. Bonaventure about the Hinsdale house extensively throughout his career. As a man of God, he truly believed that these things happened and even witnessed some of them for himself. I do try to keep an open mind about these sorts of things, having been on the receiving end of what I now consider to be supernatural activity in that house. I cannot have any other explanation for it. I was t truly stunned. Even my daughter, my daughter who, you know, she's she was 18 at the time. She's probably 19 actually by the time this posts because her, her birthday is October 15th. So happy birthday. Happy 19th birthday to my daughter Neve. Um, But she went in as a skeptic too, you know, and we were both stunned. We were so stunned and we could not stop talking about it when we got in the car. So I try to keep an open mind, you know, and after all, it is Halloween when the veil between the two worlds thins and we're able to look at things differently that the rest of the year we might normally write off as foolish or impossible. <laughs> so what do you think about the dandies? crazy fantastic story are you of the belief that they made it all up for attention i fail to see how they would have benefited from that attention considering they were financially ruined after the purchase of this house many of them ended up in the hospital they almost lost their son mike and eventually they did lose their daughter laura or do you think that possibly just maybe there are dark forces in the world in that house forces that don't want their home being invaded by outsiders from the world of the living what do you guys think about it? Hey guys, so I am on my way to Hinsdale House, the haunted house. I'm excited. I have everything I need. I got my phone. I got my uh, water bottle here. My Nintendo Switch, because you never know when you're going to have some downtime. My tripod. And my vlogging camera, which I'm on now. I got to pick up Nev first because she's coming with me. So she can be my camera lady. And then we are going over there. The owner says he has some equipment where we'll be able to see and sense if ghosts are around. So happy Halloween. Let's go. Okay, so we're about 35 minutes away from Hinsdale House, and I'm really excited. I keep getting nervous as I get closer. It appears that there's a lot of activity, not just in the house, but outside of it. In fact, I saw some blogs and some paranormal investigators say that there seemed to be more activity outside the house than there was in the house. But the main things that struck me was there appears to be a Native American burial ground nearby. There's a hanging tree where people would get hanged. And there's also the story of the daughter of one of the families who lived there who still haunts it. Her name's Laura, and people 
people claim they see her there still. So let's get there. Let's find out what this is all about. Let's find out if there's any truth to it. Um, I typically don't believe in haunted areas. Like I think I believe in ghosts, but I don't know if I believe in haunted areas. But I'm definitely also excited to get there because I've never actually been to one that's that's supposed to be this haunted. So let's keep on keeping on. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Klass. I own the Hinsdale House in Hinsdale, New York. Um, I started coming here about almost eight years ago as a paranormal investigator, and I was immediately drawn to the location. Um, things happen here. You don't have to sit here for hours on end for something un unspeakable to happen here. And uh, that's really what drew me to this location. Um, it was in really bad disarray, um, and it was going to be torn down, and we were basically here saying goodbye to this house. And at that point, all I knew was that there was a failed exorcism here. Um, I started doing some research and found some of the names of other people that had lived here, uh, the Dandy family that lived here in the 1970s. Uh, they immediately started having poltergeist-like activity happening in this house. Things were moving. We've actually caught things moving on our own cameras here. Um, their daughter was getting tormented. Uh, they were seeing things in, in the hills, uh, hearing things coming from the hills like uh, drum beats and chanting. And we've actually heard that ourselves, uh, uh, being here at night. Um, you know, it got to a point where they contacted a priest from St. Bonaventure University, and uh, he came here to try to help them. He brought a psychic with him, went over some of the feelings that they were feeling at the house, and then they ended up doing a sanctioned structural exorcism of this location, which didn't end up working. Um, and they advised the family to leave if there was nothing else they can do. This is all, it was all taboo back in the 1970s, and they... The family hightailed it all the way out to California and uh, didn't look back. You know, they got as far away from this place as possible. Phil, Phil's dead. Okay. Uh, Clara lives in or Eugene, Oregon now. And I just, I actually got to meet her last year, went and talked with her and heard her story from her own mouth and uh, felt her pain and agony and happiness. I mean, she loved the place and she hated the place. Mm. You know, it, it really uh, did a number on her family, you know, so... And there's count countless people that moved in and out of this place through the 1980s, and you know we've interviewed quite a few. Some lived here for a month, some lived here for a couple months. Um, I really just want to find out what's making the land and the property tick. Um, we've made strides. You know we've got a lot of uh, history that we've uncovered. You know the house was built in 1853, but we've dated it back to like 1701 now. The land and the property, some of the things that may have happened here, we found remnants of Native American artifacts buried when we were d digging the uh, septic system here in the back wow. and uh, you know there's a lot of folklore to this house but then we're trying to dig into that as well to see what the truths are and what we can uncover so this here is Michael's bedroom he was the only son of the dandy family um, Mike had accounts of games flying off the shelves those actual shelves those are the same shelves that were in this room um, he would have games that would fly off and hit him off the shelf as he was sleeping. Um, he actually passed away in a car accident two years ago. Um, speaking with Clara, she feels like the house came back and got him. He had an accident when he was a child, or not a child, but a teenager, driving a car close in, in Hinsdale, uh, and they say that what killed him was a blood clot from a previous accident. Is that what they think happened with Laura, too? Laura unfortunately succumbed to her demons and committed suicide. Do they think it was related to her being here? Because I heard someone say that she had 
told people before she died that if anything ever happened to her, she wanted to come back here. That's the theory. I mean, Clara wouldn't tell me. She said, I know why she would go back, but she wouldn't tell me why. Well, and, you know, it's, they also said she had some mental problems, but the, the spirits tormented her specifically, right. right, while she was here. So that could have been a cause of some unrest after, after leaving, even. Yeah, yeah, I feel like we've actually captured pictures of her in this house on the stairs and uh, I showed Claire the picture and she had a tear in her eye. I'll actually share that picture with you. Yeah, that would be great. And you have cameras in all the rooms all the time? I have cameras in, I have in five of the rooms right now. And, and on then the outside other too? Yep. So do you capture things on these cameras sometimes? Movement? Things oh yeah. Like when you're not here? Mm -hmm. We capture things on them when people are here, when they're not here. EVP is galore all the time um, asking for Nick. Nick Groff, he's, he's been a big part of this location since uh, I purchased it with the research and helping it out. So um, his name pops up all the time on EVPs. Nick, where's Nick? They keep asking for him to come back, yeah. But I think I think kind of in a way, the ent a lot of the entities that do communicate with us here are happy mm -hmm. with what we're, we're, you know, with what we're doing at the location. Um, it, the energy here seems a lot different than when I first purchased it. I really feel like, I know this has got like a, you know, everybody says there's demons here and, and whatnot, but I've been in demonic cases in my career, and I didn't feel like what was here was demonic. I felt like there was a bastard, maybe an asshole of a spirit, um, in this location that does come out, and you have to be prepared to handle that if you're coming here. Um, it's it's not nice. So it's... Or maybe, you know, it could even be... Like you said, in, in the 70s and things, it wasn't really something you talked about, hauntings. You just kind of wanted to avoid that. Maybe they just wanted recognition. Like, we're here, and we want somebody to know that we're here. Right. And now that you've recognized them, and, you know, you're inviting people in, they're happier with that. If yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of folklore about the two guys that owned this house originally that would, um, the stagecoach would come through. Oh, he had the brothers, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and then they would uh, store their bodies in the basement and then bury them out on the hill. So, you know, part of being able to own this location, um, I'm gonna be able to do all the stuff that I couldn't do on a normal investigation, like ground penetrating radar, and and excavations, too, yeah. diving the pond, you know, stuff that would normally be really expensive, you know, and, and extensive, so. It's been four years, but we're, we're getting that done, so. That's really cool. Yeah. And you said these are the original shelves. Those are the original shelves from the 70s. We're missing one of them. So he would sleep in here? Yep. He, he recalls sitting right on the bed and then a game flying off the shelf and hitting him in the back of the head. Um, in the 1970s in the kitchen here, Clara wrote in her book, Echoes of a Haunting, that um, Phil was sitting right over here. He smoked mm -hmm. and there was an ashtray that he was putting his ashes into it. It levitated and flung against the wall. And I actually recovered that ashtray. Really? I have it, yeah. Where was it? Um, it was a collector habit. This house was ransacked originally. The doors were just left open, so any of the stuff that was left in the attic or whatnot, it was just all ransacked. So I've gotten to recover a lot of things that were original to the house for a cost, for, for a price. But sure. Is it true that the families who moved in after you know it started to become haunted, they would move out and then they would just leave all their belongings behind because they just yeah. didn't want to have anything to do with yeah, it. Yeah, there was one family that lived here um, and they, they actually just left everything. They did not want what was here to know that they were leaving. Uh, I interviewed her about two years ago. She reached out to me as the house started getting a lot more popular. She saw it, she's like, oh my God, it's my old house. And she reached out to the, the Facebook page and uh, talked to me about it. There's another family that lived here that uh, left because their animals were getting affected. I mean, we've caught pictures of animals in this house. But she said that uh, she had a, a lab and those were very loyal dogs will walk by your side. Um, and it was fine until they moved here. And when they moved here, all of a sudden it ran, jolted out the door and ran in front of a car. And died. And died. Then there's been so many um, accounts of people having problems, car problems coming down the street. You know, I had, I had a lady pull her car into a ditch. When we were doing a tour, I'm like, how did you end up in the ditch? She said, I don't know. No, she didn't know. She just didn't have control of the vehicle. Yeah. Then. Electronics stopping to work and things like that. That'll so happen a lot. We saw something where a woman said the camera just kept turning off. 
Yeah. It happens. I mean, it happens a lot here. That it's an energy draw. Now this is uh, this is where the exorcism was performed right here. So this is where the exorcism was performed. Yeah. So they knelt on the floor. A priest was saying what he had to say, and they said the house shook. Mm -hmm. The windows were rattling, and it sounded like it was crying as they were performing this exorcism of the of the location. Um, there, they had uh, dolls flying off the shelves. Um, this is one of the original dolls right here that we recovered back. Creepy looking, but... <clears throat> now, the, Clara said that the house did feel cleared probably for a few weeks, but then back right back to where they were before. This also was an original piece. This was a chest that they brought in from Buffalo that was taken from the house that, that got returned. That was actually the dandy's chest. What does it say? Galt? Yeah, that was added after the fact, but <clears throat> I showed Claire on and she said, yeah, that was our old chest. That was... How cool. On the back it says... Buffalo in there. It says Downing. It says Mr. B. Bormers, Humphrey Road, Buffalo, New York. And that's where they came from before they moved here. This is like one of those chests you used to bring when you went on a ship voyage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little beat up. So but cool. Well, I think it's. I like them better when they're a little beat oh, up. Yeah. I think it looks so Gives cool. Them character. Yes, for sure. And do you have these things around here in case you can sense movement? Right. Yeah. So we like we have a camera right here in the living room, so we've actually seen those move on their own. Yeah, um, that's what I was thinking when I saw the wind chime hanging right there. Yep, and that shadow box was actually Clara's too. That uh, with the mirror. That was original. This here? Mm-hmm. This used to be a door? Yeah, so originally the door is where you came in, mm -hmm. um, and throughout time they actually put a door in here. Where did you get this from? That was that was here. That was always oh my here. God, that is so cool. What did you do? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, should we go upstairs? Yeah, unless you want to get a picture of the basement. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. This regular basement's terrify me as it is. <laughs> this is the best room in the house now. The bathroom. <laughs> I was in here and I was like, there's so many creepy angels around. So this door was the original door for the bathroom and it was actually buried under three levels of flooring. So we were able to get that and put it back up. Wait, the door was buried? Yeah. Where was it buried? Here. It was why would at, they do that? I don't know what they, why or why they would use it for a piece of flooring, but... It kind of makes you nervous. It kind of makes you nervous why they buried it. Now, as we were tearing down some of the walls in here, uh, we actually found... Um, artifacts in the walls. We found a letter from that was written by Beth, which was one of the daughters of the Dandy family. And we found these carved bull heads. And we ended up researching those and finding out that they were uh, neckerchief slides for Boy Scouts. <laughs> which which means it was like probably 1950s, 1960s. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we hung out earlier, didn't we? <laughs> this, this toilet used to be like right here. It oh, doesn't make sense. Right so the door would just come open on its own. I had to put this latch on it because the door would just fly. Yeah, the door would come open on its and own. You have to see that. <laughs> That's so much fun, huh? Holy shit. Well, I'm, not, I'm not really not going to be in my best bed. Oh my god. I don't know how you almost felt that. It's like, it's like, oh, this is deep. It's like, oh, this is dead behind the house. I'm going to do it to my own. Oh my god. It was a double bed. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> Wow. It's supposedly where they kept the bodies, you know. Oh my yeah, god. Of course, I mean, it makes perfect sense, honestly. This is where you would keep them. It's just, it's just a chair. Look at the wall. Yeah. Like, she's, sit, like she's at a soccer game. Or yeah, people sit down here and they sit down here. <laughs> communicate with entities and spirits. They do, they sit down here for like long periods of time. Hours. Look at the walls. I know, I love the walls. Yeah, it's real, they're really cool. How many spiders have you found? Big ones? <laughs> Any of them. <laughs> a lot. Here, Neff, I want you to go ahead of me in case you fall. You're not going to fall. You're the one who's going to fall. <laughs> if anyone, I know. it's going to be you. It's okay. I'm old. You're young. You have your whole life out of you. Look 
at this wallpaper. It's beautiful. Mm. I love it. You would. <laughs> I get, I get like a chill thing. More angels. They had small bedrooms. So yeah. is this the master here? Yes. That's the only bedroom with a closet. <laughs> this is Laura's room here. And you can see like the layers of wallpaper I tried to keep intact. So is this the window that they see her at? No, they're seeing her in this one. This one? Yes. This Whose is room your, was this, Mary? This, this is Mary's room. This is the room um, where all the bugs flock to. Um, we've had infestations of, of bees in the floorboards. We've had... Uh, Fly infestations in here, and then they just. I was gone. swarmed by flies outside when I was recording you. Oh, really? I was like, these flies are like getting caught in my hair. Flies, I have bees in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. That this was the one room that people just don't. The, oh my god! You feel it when you walk in there. It's like a different energy. Yes, right? yes, yes. Um, the bees were here from like the 1970s. She talked about them in her book. And I had, it was about four feet into the um, floorboards, the, the honeycomb. Look, my goosebumps won't go away. From just stepping in the way you did. Just it's stepping like a, in. Like it was a, like a wall almost. Really? It feels like a different energy when you it walk in so there. It looks so like, it looks so nice. Here, I'm going to go in. This okay. room, they actually boarded off. Really? When they lived here, they didn't want anybody going in there. So when people sleep over, do they usually stay here? Sometimes they sleep Holy in that room. Crap, this is awesome. Isn't that cool? That this is too. so cool. No, it is. Yeah. It's the same. Good in here. <laughs> Let's check this one. Oh, 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 whoa. Oh. Is there somebody? Like you just walk through somebody that was watching you. Yeah, and I'm feeling it. A fan from the other side, perhaps. Very cold. <laughs> I just get very cold. I have goosebumps. It just... That's an interesting t technique. Why is it interesting? <laughs> because you're pointing them in the same direction. Because I think they're trying to avoid it. See? Yeah. I saw that, right? <gasps> Oh my god, it's shooting like up. Yeah, because I, I feel like they're moving around almost so that I don't... They have to get used to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh the, my oh, god. Wow. That was a really high spike. Like right next to you. Oh my god. Oh Confirming my god. It. That's insane. Someone here? Do you want to talk? And there's no electricity there. There's no reason for that to be going off right there, except for that there's an energy that it's picking up. Maybe right you here. look in her room again. And no, it's her. right here. I can feel it, like right by the stairs. You'll see oh it going God. off. You think it's? Think and it's that's at this staircase, right? Laura, is that you? Stop touching those. If it's you, walk. Step away from those. No, that's crazy. There she is again. That's yeah. amazing. It's nice to meet you. Stephanie might start a new career. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Making quick friends with the spirits, huh? I would love to. <laughs> YouTube channel number two. <laughs> wow. <sighs> that's crazy. Yeah. I feel bad. I feel like I don't want to leave her now. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, so you're investigating with that. You need more tools if you want to get answers. So you need to do recordings, or you need to, yeah. you know. There's. I have a spirit box downstairs too. What's the spirit box do? So it uses um, a scanning radio, and it gets the white noise from the radio, and theoretically, it allows the spirits to actually speak over that white noise. Um, it has a, a coil in it, which allows the words that are coming out of it to actually so you can actually hear them. It's really cool. It's um, invented by a guy named uh, George Brown in Cleveland. On playback, right? You would hear it on playback? No, it's live. 
This yeah. is a this is a live recording. Or not even a recording, it's live. You're, you're hearing it as, as if you're having a conversation like me and you. As opposed to using a recorder. Can we do that? Yeah. Can you get it? Yeah, that would be so awesome. Oh my god, that's incredible. That's amazing. <clears throat> No, honestly, I didn't either. And you heard as soon as he said, if that's you, she stop stopped. Away, it stopped immediately. It stopped immediately. It's really cool, too, the way they made it in the case. That's beautiful. Are you there? Are you the one that was communicating with us? Can you speak a little louder? Hello? Is your brother Mike with you? Were you showing Stephanie that you were here by holding, holding on to those devices? It just flickered again. Do you like her? Hi, Laura. How are you? It's so nice to meet you. Can you talk to me? Do you want me to know anything? Are you happy? Laura, are you happy? So is that, what is that that you hear now? That's a coil on the inside that just keeps spinning around and then every time it gets to the end it flicks and keeps spinning. So it's when they talk it's very low so that actually it's like a vibrational field that helps to hold their voice up so you can hear it better. I heard a mm -hmm. voice. Yeah, there's a there's a, definitely a female voice. This is what I'm talking about too, like giving it energy, so using like a Tesla coil that would allow them maybe that would allow them to speak in broader sentences because you have to think that the energy used to try to say one word if you don't have a body or yeah. a conduit is going to be so much, you know? Is that the inside that when you hear it in a tree? Mm -hmm. Why uh, something wait, is, it's not the, different? Oh, this? Yeah. No, this, that's just the way it is. No, like it's playing here. Well, sometimes it turns Oh, around. yeah, that's just so... It's, it's a visual, so if something's coming out of it, you actually get to see it too. It sounds, a lot of the theory is that there's another plane that these spirits live on, or they're, that they're in. And I there's mean, things happening in it, because it sounds like the sounds of a house. It sounds mm -hmm. like, sounds like just, just like a conversation, living. having a conversation going on in, in the background. And that's what, that's what I always tell people, it's like, it could be that, it could be picking it up from a different plane. Can you hear us? I've yet to, I've, I've asked so many times and I've yet to get an answer of what do they see. You know? Or if they don't even see us, if we don't see them, they just sense it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're investigating us. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, thank you for letting me come in here and see you. Can you hear me, Laura? Mm-hmm. Something sounds walking through. 
walking with us right now. Are you walking around us, Laura? Do you think you could let me see you, Laura? You might have to listen to that on the recording. Like she said, yeah. Oh, did yes. she? Yeah. It's hard, it's hard for me to hear it from behind it, so I, just, I knew really? I heard something, yeah. Do you want to come over here? No, it's fine. <laughs> Laura, do you think that I could see you? I've heard a lot about you. I wish we could talk to each other. I really do wish we could talk to each other. I wish I could meet you. They're pretty well versed. There have been so many teams have come in that use these devices that they know how to manipulate those. They did that when I first started coming here. That was a man's voice. Who else is here, Laura? Is someone else with you? There's somebody else here? Anybody can talk to us. Hello. What's up? Who do we have the pleasure of speaking with? that Mike? Did you say Mike? Well, whoever you are, it's very nice to meet you. I wish you could talk to me. Do you have anything to say? Stephanie. What is your name? Laura, are you still here? times where we've gotten musical instruments coming through. That was pretty. We've had singers come through, like you can hear them singing, like opera or something. It's really weird. Piano. It's piano. It does sound like sound banging piano on a piano. Or an organ or it sounds like they're hitting a piano just to make a noise. Are you guys playing the piano or the organ? I love music. Would you play me something? Whatever your favorite song is. Or you can sing for me. Whatever you want. I hear footsteps. Sounds like footsteps or doors. Which we don't have any. Yeah, exactly. Go to the bathroom. It's almost like they're stomping around trying to make noises because they can't verbalize everything yet. So they're just trying to make some sort of like noise. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's so neat. Turn this off. So cool. Yeah. yeah. This is too, too like um this is kind of a new device that just came out too. It's uh 
called the paranormal music box. So this is a motion detector. And the guy's attached a music box to it. So like if you're in another room, yeah, it's not going on. it'll start playing music. And we, so like if something moves in front of it, it'll start going on. Uh, uh, is that Madwell? Oh, yes. No, it's not. It sounded no, like Madwell. It did. Are you sure it's not Madwell? It's Sound of Silence. Oh. But it has the beginnings to Madwell. Yes. And usually we just set them like that, and then if something bre breaks the plane, it, it goes off. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah, really for awesome. sure. And now I feel bad. I feel like I don't want to leave. Yeah, well, the, they say once you get there, it calls you back. <laughs> I feel like I'm just coming in and disturbing them and leaving. Bye, Laura. Bye. So, I mean, what's, what's crazy about it, though, is I distinctively heard voices. Exactly. Like a man and a woman's voice. And really, how is that possible unless it is what it is? Right. Well, nothing else is coming out of it. So this was this was the ashtray, little fire bucket. Mm. They actually still had the dent in it. Oh my gosh! How cute! <laughs> that is a cute That's ashtray, so isn't it? <laughs> so part of the folklore is that these two guys that lived in this house they would store the bodies, kill people in the basement. So when we were renovating the basement um, and we were cutting into the floorboards. I sent off a piece of wood to a guy in Columbus to make a spirit box out of it. And when he cut into it, he found a bullet shard inside of the wood. No. And it's pre it's pre revolutionary war. Pre revolutionary war. Oh my war. god. So theoretically then this bullet hit a tree, it was harvested and used to make the Hinsdale house. But it's still That's kinda cool. That's really cool. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean I had it checked out because I didn't I didn't want to just make assumptions of oh, somebody was shot in the basement, you know, like And these were the camera is being weird. I know. You're absolutely right. These were the bolt these were the neckerchief slides that we found in the walls. <laughs> in the we were, I was scared at first. I'm like, carved bullheads. Right. What does this mean? Why are there two? You know. What like, does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> this was Michael's when he was a kid. A little tomahawk. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me for this series of videos. I really, really enjoyed telling you this story and I hope that you enjoyed it as much. Like this video if you liked it, share it if you think it's worth sharing. Don't forget to subscribe because YouTube loves to play this cheeky little game with me where they unsubscribe people from my channel and then they don't notify you when I post videos. <laughs> It's really great having coworkers who, you know, try to keep things interesting and always play pranks on you. But make sure you are still subscribed. If you were subscribed and if you haven't subscribed yet and you like what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button because Halloween is still in full swing. Thank you guys so much for being here. I hope to hear everything you have to say in the comment section so we can chat about it. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky. And I will see you very, very soon. Bye. I got blood